we'll start, we'll go through it fairly chronologically. Yeah, sure. Um, we sort of, so the, the whole Fox um, Cast Force program and everything sort of kicked off in 98 with the mm-hmm. Fox that jumped off the boat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, before then, though, do you recall um, any discussion in Parliament about some possible scenarios regarding Foxes? Was it ever on the radar that this might happen and did the Greens have any sort of policies in that area? I don't recollect that there was any... Um, specific discussion about foxes might come in on the boat or anything like that. We were aware of the uh, terrible risk that foxes would pose, particularly to uh, Tasmanian native species. Um, And in particular, I knew about that because I had established the Threatened Species Network in Tasmania years earlier and had been expounding what the threatening processes could be. Um, in Tasmania and how important Tasmania was because we were fox free and that's why we still had all the small marsupials that were either extinct or highly endangered on mainland Australia. So it was that connection with foxes and native wildlife that we were very aware of but not aware of any immediate threat. Mm, Sure and um, when it happened when the the fox did jump off the boat um, was was the information about it fairly freely available to you, did you find? Um, because it was sort of, it was a bit embarrassing for mm. quarantine in Tasmania when it happened. And um, do you recall exactly the, the, the circumstances under which it happened, how it was allowed to happen, how it got... Um, it, as I recollected, it wasn't very easy to get information because um, the government was not being forthcoming because basically there was a big blunder underway. Um, we, we became aware that there had been foxes living on the wharf in Melbourne and that uh, it was sort of a no-brainer that at some point a fox would get onto the boat and come out the other end but we hadn't known that at the time um, and that at the other end it was, uh, it was just sort of open to basically walk off the wharf and, uh, and, and get, get loose. Um, I recollect that we had people go and have a look at the situation up there and come back and tell us that, you know, although the government was saying the wharf area was secure, there was no way that it was secure uh, and that a fox could have easily slipped out. So we became aware then that something needed to be done and, and I can recall pushing the government about, about what are you going to do to tighten it up on the Tasmanian end and basically not getting anything that resembled answers, nothing that told us that anybody had actually sat down and said, we've got a problem, we've got to fix it, this is what we're going to do. And bizarrely, but not unusually, unfortunately, um, in the Tasmanian Parliament, even though the the minister was getting embarrassed and getting a bit of a grilling, didn't seem to lead to any immediate action to try and remedy that situation, even Mm. if it was to get the minister out of the problem rather than to deal with the foxes. Mm. Yeah, I've actually read in Hansard the question about a hole in the fence that wasn't fixed for another four or so years. Mm, mm. After that, they kept um, the Greens kept asking whether it had been fixed, and there's still big. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, the hole that was that was typical. You know, there was a hole in the mm. fence. We raised the hole in the fence. Anybody could go and see the hole in the fence, but nothing mm. was done. Um, the story I've heard regarding that fox and has been backed up on by a couple of people is that it was. Um, discovered while the ship was on its way um, into dock and they, mm. they tried to report it that they had a fox on board and that that um, uh, signal was ignored on, at the Burnie dock. Mm. Did you, did you recall? No, I, don't, I didn't know anything about that. Mm. I can't say I'm surprised, however. <laughs> I mean, I guess because one of the things was the attitudes at that time. They were, first of all, there was a lot of ignorance. There just wasn't an understanding of what a risk um, or a threat foxes were, not only to wild, native wildlife, but to farming. And in fact, there was this attitude that it was all a jolly good bit of fun because it would get the greenies stirred up mm. and that it might be highly entertaining to stir them up by having foxes. And in fact, if there were any repercussions, then that would be, that would be hilarious as well because it would have done, done the greenies over and done the environment over, ha, ha, ha. 
Mm. Mm. I mean, just to show how lax it was, they, the ship went back and forth several times before they even examined it for DNA to get any sort of genotyping mm. they could have from hair or mm. anything like that. It just wasn't mm. taken that seriously. Mm. Um, yeah, and the person in charge at the time up there was Peter Williams in charge of Quarantine Tasmania. Of course, yes. Um, now, um, the, that uh, infiltration, um, I would have thought there'd be some sort of legislation to prosecute if something like that happened. Mm. Was, that, was that ever brought up at the time? I don't know whether it was brought up whether or not there was legislation to prosecute, but there was cer it was certainly brought up that action should be taken. And, I mean, the, the first thought was just let's stop it happening, make sure it can't. Um, if um, we had thought about prosecution, it would have been in order to, to act as a deterrent. Um, given that it was a situation that nobody had sort of um, thought through and organised for, probably in the first instance we, we thought, well, that's what we need to do, organise to make sure that it doesn't happen again, um, rather than exact retribution because it did. Um, in hindsight, it might have been a jolly good thing to get some prosecution going um, straight away. But the basis on which you do it, I'm not quite sure. Mm. Um, I think it potentially didn't exist, uh, although maybe you could have found something in the quarantine laws. Yeah, and a similar thing, I'm trying to stay away from the rumours and the hearsay mm. and everything, mm. but after that happened, there were a lot of layoffs in that area in quarantine at the Bernie Docks and Peter Williams was to move on to become general manager of De Peewee. Mm. Um, and there were a number of Fox hoaxes around that time, which many speculate were to get back at him for those sort of layoffs. Do you recall any <laughs> stories about that? I'll try to, oh, look, to get onto I, these I, I but... mean, I, I do recollect that we, we were constantly asking questions about quarantine in the Parliament for years before that and, and through that period because there was always a problem that quarantine was not rigorous enough that quarantine wasn't on the case, that quarantine wasn't really um, checking things over on the boat the way they should. This isn't limited to foxes at all. This is around a whole range of issues. Um, and we, we were pushing always for the government to allocate more resources into quarantine, but what was happening instead was that there were layoffs. Um, and, and there was some mad idea that you could uh, do quarantine by some other method than actually having people on the on the ground and on and around the boat, uh, and and we I know we weren't impressed when uh, when that um, occurred. It was clearly a cost cutting thing. Um, here we've got Tasmania saying it's clean and green, and on the other hand, you know, not doing anything to safeguard that status. But I I don't. I don't recall hearing anything about hoaxes being in response to those layoffs. Mm -hmm. um, I never quite understood why people would want to indulge in the hoaxes. Yeah, well, the hoaxes have been a big part of it because um, they have sort of accidentally or sometimes maybe on purpose mixed in with the actual phys physical evidence, which has mm. served to discredit the program and the mm, work mm, that they were doing, mm. which has been a bad public relations thing, and no one's ever been prosecuted with committing a hoax, although there's many that have been proven. Yeah, well, I think a pro I mean a problem with the hoaxes was that it it meant that that right from the start there was always this huge question mark about whether it was real, mm. and there still is for a lot of people. Although I, you know. <laughs> I think that's wishful thinking on their part that they don't want to think that it's real or they or somewhere they actually want it to be real but not to be recognized you know I don't know um, but but it's it, it's been a terrible terrible problem um, and a sort of a, I guess it's a uniquely Tasmanian sort of a thing in a way um, I can't imagine that those sort of hoaxes would have got such currency in terms of the mainstream debate about whether or not the whole thing is true um, in other states, there was there was some, you know, there's, it's touched some chord in Tasmania that people want the whole thing to be a hoax. They want to think that the government's wasting money. Um, they want to think that it, it doesn't matter. Um, whereas in fact, it matters very much. And it matters in ways that I think a lot of people still don't understand actually about their livelihoods as much as about um, our threatened, flora, uh, the threatened fauna. 
you think that goes to just a general distrust of government? I think it must be a general distrust of government, and it's also about government wanting to interfere about what goes on across the landscape. And I think mm. it's in that in that arena. Um, uh, uh, I, yeah, I can't I can't explain it myself because I don't I don't really understand it. It's always puzzled me um, because it. it it was something that did, I mean, it just manifested around around the foxes. Um, and I always felt some of it was people just wanting the foxes to actually get established for their own perverse reasons. Others was people just not wanting to believe that government knew anything, you know. It, this is your way of saying government actually never knew about the bush and it never knew about wildlife and it never knew what we should be doing in the landscape and here this thing on foxes sort of proves it, but it's actually um, touching back to all the other conservation debates that have been going on, is trying to prove that, you know, governments are just completely out of touch and, you, and don't know how to deal with it. Um, so the next, the, the, the next big in incident was around 2001, mm -hmm. where the so-called fox plot took place um, in the police investigation. Now, there's a, a bit of a, it's a bit strange to the timeline here. Um, David Llewellyn said that he briefed you and Sue Napier about this. Um, it was a private briefing about a police investigation involving an importation of cubs yep. along Illawarra Road in Longford. Right. Um, now he says that he, he did that as soon as he became aware of it, which was at the start of the spring session of parliament. Although he found out about it much earlier than that. Do you recall at all that meeting or that briefing that you found I out? have a vague recollection of that um, meeting and that briefing because I know I was tremendously concerned when I learnt that there could have been a deliberate introduction and deliberate bringing in of cubs. Um, and I think, you know, the request was to sort of not get in the way of an investigation um, was part of that briefing, but also letting us know that it was going on. Was it, um, it had just started at that time or it was underway or, or it was... Yeah, I, I can't really recall. I can sort of, um, I can recollect that there was some concern that we might get in the way of, of it somehow, but actually I had had no idea it was going on. Mm. So, so the likelihood I was going to get in the way of anything was pretty small. Um, but I, I think I also was a, a, a little alarmed that this had been going on for some while and nothing seemed to mm. have really happened apart from, uh, you know, a bit of a tiz. Um, at the departmental and ministerial level. I think um, because Andrew Napier was working in the prospect office oh. and he was involved in the investigations and that's one of the reasons why Llewellyn had to mm. make it known. He did want to keep it quiet mm. and mm. Um, that was one of the reasons he had to um, do that. But oh, that's, yeah, I can't be sure of that, of yeah, course. Yeah. Um, now that that investigation, I, there are several different versions of what occurred along Illawarra Road. I've spoken to people who went to the property, um, and they say that the and at the time there were some aerial photographs of some pens which had been bulldozed, and they were passed around and shown to be evidence. Do you recall any suggestion that there was physical evidence of these pens, or whether it was just a story that? that had been told around the pub? Um, I don't ever remember hearing about that physical evidence of pens at all. So um, that just might mean I was out of the loop. You know, there I was, a Green in Parliament, who <laughs> didn't always get get told everything that was happening. Um, and I wouldn't have been connected with the local gossip in the area. Mm. Um, so when we, when we had people in every electorate, we were much more likely to hear that sort of thing. But it was hard for me to really be be getting told that unless someone specifically got in touch and let me know. Sure. Uh, the, I mean, the in police investigation could find no evidence to support this mm. theory or this story, um, but it was generally understood by the people on the ground at the time and a number of people in Parliament that actually had happened. Mm -hmm. Did you form an opinion at that time? Yeah, I mean, I, I formed the opinion that there had been 
attempt, deliberate attempt or attempts at um, introductions and that one had occurred on the east coast I've been told. Now I can't recollect where I got that information from now but I thought it was fairly reliable um, and so that there w wasn't necessarily just one um, and, and that various may have been under investigation but that we were looking at not simply the random incident any longer of a fox walking off um, a boat, random but predictable, um, but that but that this was something, you know, something else, something much bigger and, and much nastier in the sense that it was very deliberate. Um, and and um, being very concerned about whether the police were really going to take it seriously and follow it up, given um, the way we'd seen Tasmania police not be particularly interested in um, wildlife issues um, and nature conservation issues in the past. Yeah, um, much has been made that, that, that I've heard from many different sources that the actual, <laughs> the reason why the police investigation came up with nothing was that the rangers had a lot of leads, they had a lot of information, they briefed the minister they, and they then the police rushed in mm. and the rangers warned them if the police went in that everyone would go to ground and wouldn't talk about it and that would be it, they wouldn't be able to turn up anything. Mm. Um, does that sound feasible? Does that ring any bells of how things might have played out that you recall? Uh, look, I didn't know the intimate detail of how things played out. I know the police never seemed to get anywhere and I, I um, recollect putting in a Freedom of Information application to try and find out later what had gone on, you know, exactly how thorough had this investigation been and there was nothing written down. Um, between the department and the police, the minister, justice, you know, wherever. There was just no paper trail whatsoever to show that there was any formal approach or made or any um, minutes of meetings even, anything like that. So, I mean, I actually formed the view that it really hadn't been a serious attempt to investigate. It, I mean, it could be that um, when people saw the police involved, they um, <laughs> went to ground, so to speak. Um, but it also, I, I was anxious about whether the police were serious about it. And I had heard um, on the rumour mill that people who were quite closely connected with the police or mates or whatever it may have actually been involved and that there could have been an issue like that as well. And, um, you know, in Tasmania, unfortunately, those sorts of rumours often turn out to be correct. Yes, I interviewed Ivan Dean about this, who was in charge of the investigation at the time, and he maintains that it was the best police operation, the best police he could have possibly investigated it, and that's about the only person that will back up the police. Mm. It's been a, yeah. I mean, I guess one of my concerns was, was around the fact that the, a police investigation being launched may have led to tip-offs of people to basically hide the evidence and you fix it, figure out their story and all that sort of thing. There were threats of violence too, which are well documented. I've seen the police report which said that one of the people who was interrogated said that he wouldn't speak after there was a threat of violence, so that was that shut off that particular avenue. Mm. So, mm. Yeah, that was all very unfortunate. Um, um, now, what was I up to? So, Um, there was also given as a reason why they didn't prosecute was the statute of limitations that expired before they could find evidence. Mm. But um, other people dispute that and say that that was never in place. Do you recall? I don't remember now, although oh, vague, vague bells ringing um, that they that may have potentially been brought up in later years in some of the estimate committee hearings mm. or something. Um, I mean, certainly it is a, a bit of a problem, the statute of limitations, but it's also, as I have discovered personally, a ploy that's often used by the police when they don't really want to do anything, is they just faddle around until the statute of limitations has expired and then say they couldn't, couldn't act. I mean, that happened in relation to um, another incident that um, I was involved with where people took the wheel nuts off my car and we reported it to the police and we had the licence plate number of the 
the people, we had witnesses, we had their description, and the police just didn't get round to going and check it out for six months. Sure, I can imagine. Mm. Yes. Um, and I, I mean, I, I said I wasn't going to go with rumours or anything, but do you know anything of the motivations which might, why, might have been behind people bringing in foxes? Well, you, I, I, only, um, I only know of motivations sort of speculatively uh, and that were sort of rumoured to me um, around serving the Greenies right and um, bringing in some foxes and letting them go because it had really pissed the Greenies off um, without apparently any um, actual um, grasp on exactly how serious it would be and how it would do an awful lot more than just annoy um, some environmentalists. Um, and I think, I don't even know now whether people understand the impact on primary industry that you I might get so. if, um, if foxes came in, as well as that the um, impact on native um, species isn't just unfortunate for, you know, for the high levels of endangerment and extinction that you're likely to see, but of course this whole tourism industry based on um, uh, the natural attributes of Tasmania would really suffer because it's the small animals that people really like to come and see. Um, so I think it was a bit, it was a bit of that, um, as far as I understand. Um, and I don't know whether it was really people wanting to have fox foxes to hunt or whether that was some sort of um, excuse that was put in front of the, of the real motivation to just mm. sort of have a bit of fun by bringing them in because, um, you know, it would stir people up. There was speculation about the change in gun laws before then and also to do with the game management plans which were introduced to stop people poaching on private property mm -hmm. and people were pissed off about that and which is yeah a motivation which these people who were accused were definitely primed to yeah yeah um, be involved in but uh, again it's all speculation oh, well, we can't um, yeah well that's interesting about the gun laws because um uh the greens had been very heavily involved in the uh in the new gun laws after port arthur but i mean with the other two parties we all three agreed um but certainly david llewellyn was won't when people rang his office to complain about gun laws, to say that they were all my, my fault and tell them that they, they should ring my office. Right. And we would get calls saying that the minister had said to ring me about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, there were... Yeah. <laughs> there, were there certainly... Um, there, was a, there was a deal of resentment and um, it was sheeted home to the Greens. I mean, the particular resentment actually that was blamed on me was around being out how close to someone's house you could shoot. Um, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now in late um, January in 2002, you um, began to put pressure on Llewellyn and Bacon to use the Treasurer's Reserves to mm. fund the, the program or to, you know, whatever, the Fo Fox Free Task Force, which was established before then. Um, can you describe the, the resistance you found when you tried to apply that pressure? Because well, they seemed to be stalling as far as the funding at that point. Yeah, well, I mean, it became apparent to, to me that uh, we really needed um, a fast injection of big money to get on top of the problem fast. But that the government was incrementally dribbling out money and it was never putting the resources on the ground that were actually necessary um, at any time to really hit, hit the problem hard. Uh, what they were trying to do was fund it out of the current departmental budget. And as a result, were actually diverting money away from other really important programs that needed to continue, but not managing to be as effective as they needed to be against foxes either. So I was pushing that they needed to get money um, additional money for unforeseen uh, circumstances, which is what the Treasurer's Reserve is and what this problem was, so that they could really hit, hit the problem um, with all the resources that were necessary. Um, also um, trying to get them to get some money out of the federal government for this because of the um, large implications for, um, for nature conservation and for primary industries. And how did, how did they resist that? What was their sort of way of getting out of your questioning and your 
um, had what? Yeah, no, well, I mean, I think, to be honest, I mean, the attitude of the government at the time was that my questions were a minor irritation during the period that they were being asked in Parliament and then they forgot about them. Um, <laughs> well, I had had a similar um, response when I'd first started asking about genetically engineered crop trials. And it was only when I'd persisted and managed to severely embarrass the minister about the fact that they'd been held and he hadn't even known in the state that he, you know, that anyone got focused. So that had happened in 98, 90, no, 99. Um, so um, I just don't think they took that pressure seriously. And when they did, it was all stonewalling. It was all the minister justifying himself about how he, um, he, he was doing his best to find the money and he couldn't possibly take it out of the Treasurer's Reserve and I didn't understand what the Treasurer's Reserve was meant to be about. And so on. Well, of course, he couldn't take it out of the Treasurer's Reserve. The Treasurer had to make that decision. But I think, you know, um, reading between the lines of the way he replied to those questions, he hadn't actually taken it to Cabinet as a request. He was treating it all as an in-house problem that he had to deal with but one that he'd taken a long time to recognise was really a problem. Even when his people had been telling him, he hadn't um, integrated it himself. And when he did, he was just being defensive and trying to fob me off. Sure. And um, as far as the application for federal funding goes, mm. um, there was a delay in that. Um, they messed up the application, is it? Yeah, the, um, there was a... There was a a um, process through which uh, the the state could apply for the funds and there was a deadline and a form in which the application needed to be put in and so on and we drew we drew it to the minister's attention and we urged him to do something um, he claimed that he had uh, but in actual fact it transpired that instead of putting in a proper application some sort of vague letter had been sent to the minister and uh, 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 David Llewellyn, when he answered those questions in Parliament, was very defensive and um, his speciality was being extraordinarily vague uh, so that you couldn't really quite understand what he told you and he was like that on this occasion but it became quite apparent in the end that um, it had been completely stuffed up this application and so we were waiting at least another year if not more to even be able to apply to get the sorts of money that we needed to get urgently. Um, so it was, it was a it was a stuff up at the departmental level and there was a minister who wasn't even um, creating a fuss about the fact that this hadn't been done and hadn't been done properly. Yes. Um, in July of 2001, that's when the actual task force was established. Mm. Um, how privy were you to how their operations were going to um, play out, what the, the what they'd actually be doing on the ground? Were you consulted and did you have a say in any, anything? Oh, look, I, I suspected I was briefed that it had happened um, mm. and I'd certainly there would be, have been announcements made in the parliament, um, but I don't recollect being asked <laughs> anything about how they should operate. I know, um, I mean, but I kept in contact with the conservation groups and I know that the Tasmanian Conservation Trust was actually um, interacting quite heavily about what should happen and not getting a lot of traction. Um, so um, I know I was concerned from the outset that although the Top Fox Task Force had been set up, um, there were actions that it wasn't taking that I would have liked to see taken and that it was you know seemed to be pretty much a softly softly approach to start off with mm. do you remember um having any criticisms of the tactics that were involved because there were many criticisms at the time that um people weren't employed people who were employed weren't chosen on merit it was more you show up with a gun license and you know someone you get a four-wheel drive and you can take off sort of thing do you remember um anything like that and there was a lot of cases well, a lot of, there were several incidents involving poaching when they were on company time sort of thing, when they were meant to be. <laughs> they, they, they got into a lot of trouble early yeah. on, basically, they were seen as cowboys. Do you, do you recall that? I do remember being concerned that it wasn't particularly professional, that um, it wasn't clear um, how you got to be a member of the task force, nor exactly what the writing instructions were for people 
in the task force apart from get out there and see if you can see a fox and see if you can shoot it um, and and that you know in terms of being methodical it wasn't wasn't clear that that was happening and it wasn't clear that there was a lot of forethought going on about you know exactly what you might do to track down and deal with um, uh, foxes getting into 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 the countryside and potentially breeding mm. and around this time of course the, the, the discussion of Kennedy baiting came up and mm. I know the Greens were quite reluctant but they accepted the the advice given about mm. the 1080 baits yeah that's right I mean we'd campaigned for years about getting rid of 1080 um, baiting of native wildlife um, but uh, confronted with the need to potentially bait a feral animal to get rid of it then um, we, we had to consider um, whether to treat that favourably and what else you could do in a situation where you needed to try and cover the landscape um, but you couldn't possibly do it by putting people everywhere. Um, and, and key for me was ensuring that you could deliver baits in such a way that they could be taken by foxes but not by the wildlife and also understanding that you needed a much higher dose to get wildlife than you needed for foxes. So. Um, uh, realising those two things, um, we were prepared to accept baiting as long as there were stringent provisions implied. What we were concerned about was just um, uh, then getting um, farmers willy-nilly to do the baiting and whether they'd do it properly. We really wanted it to be done under the supervision of and by the Fox Task Force members rather than by random people who may or may not do it properly. And also there was a bit of a delay as well, getting mm. things going, which was sort of discussed as far as funding. But um, there were a number of experts that were brought in from the mainland um, around this time to give advice. They wrote up reports. So I've spoken to a number of them. And their um, pretty much universal consensus is that they were ignored and not taken seriously. Mm. Um, did, did you recall at all these reports or that... Um, the complaints which were registered against the program by these people? I do remember that there were experts brought in, um, that they seemed to be making sensible suggestions but that they didn't get traction. Um, I can't recollect now exactly what it was that they sure. were um, recommending. Um, but certainly there was that tenor that in, a, in Tasmania we know better somehow, even though we've brought these experts in. Um, if they tell us something we don't want to hear, we're not going to hear it. Um, and that was pretty alarming. I, I know also that there was discussion of, uh, of things like this red hot mama idea of, um, of you know, bringing in a, a, uh, a female fox on heat to try and attract the male foxes so that you could, um, uh, well obviously you could, you could attract them, you could um, knock them off um, and that you could do that in a controlled sort of a manner. Um, and there just wasn't even a willingness to look at it. Now, it may or may not have been a good idea, but to just dismiss it out of hand seemed extraordinary. Mm. Absolutely. Um, okay. the, I mean, one of the main things that the experts were saying is you have to deal with this now or mm. three, you've got three year, two or three years at the most to deal with this problem. I mm. mean, now we're sort of 10 years down the track, things yeah. are. Um, a bit more problematic um, and it, they've all said that Peter Williams was the person standing in the way of all these recommendations and I've got detailed conversations that they had with him mm. trying to get these things through. Um, to what extent, and I know this goes to uh, actual culture in government departments in Tasmania where the bureaucrats rule over the science and the experts um, can you talk at all today? Well, I think that was a particularly bad period in terms of um, bureaucrats suppressing the science and suppressing um, things that needed to happen around um, nature conservation and native wildlife, not simply um, around foxes. And that the person in charge was, um, was definitely very heavily blamed um, within and without the department and that there in fact there were issues about whether um, 
uh, problems in the nature conservation area were even getting taken to the minister or, or able to get past the bureaucrat who was blocking them. Um, there were issues about resourcing and about the primary industries side of the department being favoured over the nature conservation branch um, and, and that a lot of uh, very important matters were just sidelined because a particular individual um, had taken against them. Um, and, and it was very, very serious. Uh, there were, what it led to was constant complaints and leaking out of the Department of the Greens. It was a period during which you'd see we in, if you look through the parliamentary record, that we were repeatedly asking questions about a range of goings on in that department. And the uh, minister was um, always totally ignorant of what we were talking about. Now, he did a good line in being ignorant whether or not he was, but I think a lot of the time he was actually often kept in the dark and never got to even understand that he had a problem occurring in his portfolio. Mind you, he was perfectly willing for that situation to occur. Mm. Now, that's the portrait I've got of Peter Williams as a control freak who basically mm. wanted to have con control of all the information and the people and dose it out in order to keep everyone in line. Oh, and it wasn't just about keeping people in line. This was about exacting retribution for, you know, slights that might have happened in the past or or for a particular world view that was held that was different or anything like that. There was a lot of fear and retribution around at that time. Um, where are we to? We've sort of touched on the hoaxes. It's not really, there's, there was one in particular, though, which was the photograph which was taken in Wynyard, which, um, do you remember it was on the front page? Of oh, is this a person holding up a... No, uh, there, were, there, were, there were a few like that. I've got, I've got to hold, <laughs> hold this to them. I know that people were, oh, is this the one on the bonnet? No, this no. one was taken in the pine plantation, a photo oh, of a fox yeah. by one Leonie Bachelor who went on to work for Brian Green. Oh, right, do you, yeah. Do you recall that at all? Oh, look, I, <laughs> um, if I was reminded of it, I may recall it more. I mean, I... I um, no, and I didn't know that person went on to work for Brian Green, well, that, which is that's the, very yeah, that, interesting. That's why I mentioned it, just in case it ran any birth, yeah, because no. that, was, that was when the picture was released and her husband was sacked by Peter Williams. Right. That's when she released the right. picture. Right, right. That's just Yeah, because, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, you know, Brian Green, I don't know, I'm just trying to remember about Brian Green, because he was more, a bit more sympathetic about ferals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, yeah. Don't know, don't know. Yep. Yeah. Um, now, over the next few years, there are bits of evidence stacking up, um, and um, yeah, around. You know, there were just a, a few sort of oddities that showed up, such as do you remember the old beach, the blood that showed up at Old Beach in a chicken coop? Oh yeah. 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 Um, the blood was found there and there was no evidence of a fox, like there was no hair where the fox was cut and things like that. Do you remember any questions being raised about the validity of things like that? I, look, I may have my timing wrong, but I think that was about the time that Ivan Dean started asking questions in the Legislative Council. And, and he was the person that um, seemed to have contact with people who knew a, about that stuff. So we'd actually hear about it secondhand rather than first-hand contact to the office. Um, and I just remember wondering what on earth was going on and becoming concerned that the whole thing was becoming so muddied and so subject to this view that it was all a, all, um, a hoax and all a try-on um, just at the time that we really needed to be concentrating our effort. Mm. Because, I mean, it, that's one of the main themes that comes up is the mismanagement which leads to mm. the confusion, the muddying of the waters, mm. which is actually why I started this, mm. this whole thing. Um, well, and, and I mean, that's, that's, that's correct. That um, What should have happened is to recognise early that there was a problem, to put resources behind it, to listen to the people from the mainland and to get on with it. Um, and I think people would have accepted what was going on. But all this shilly-shallying around and allowing doubts to mushroom and not dealing with um, the situation well. And in fact, I think being reluctant to even believe it themselves at the, um, at the top levels in the department and um, the minister, 
um, you know, just created a recipe for, for the situation we've ended up with. Yeah. And that, that all changed in, yeah, 2006, where there was a roadkill up mm. in Cleveland. Oh, yeah. Um, and that's when the whole Fox Eradication Program started proper, when all the, all the funding. Um, do you remember um, the changeover when that was all announced, the funding and the big program and how that was received and how it came about? Um, well, I, I, I remember the... I remember actually um, the news coming through about the um, fox being run over at Cleveland um, and the resources then being swung behind and the creation of the fox task force and I can remember thinking good thank goodness um, but even so it sort of um, didn't really hit the spot in a lot of ways mm. unfortunately. Mm. Um, it was so long down the track as yeah. well I mean yeah that was the issue. Now, I'll get to basically where it's at currently. I said before about the sort of two or three year gap for eradication. Mm. Um, do, you, do you think, based on what you know about fox populations and a low density population, that eradication is still possible? I guess I hope it is, but I, I'm very fearful about the situation, particularly because it's um, it's crossed over with the problem with the Tasmanian devil. If the if we still had a healthy devil population through the island, I would be less concerned. Um, but because I think the devil has played a role in previous introductions in in perhaps knocking down uh, the population by attacking or, or dealing with the young somehow. Um, that's, I mean, that's just a feeling because I can't, don't know how else it is that they mm. haven't um, taken hold in the same way as the mainland, and that's our difference. Um, uh, I'm concerned. I, I live. Uh, I have a place down the Huon, and I went to a session in the Signet Town Hall about the baiting, and I, I mean, I was just flabbergasted to realise how widespread sightings had become. I had been told a year previous to that. Uh, about a collection of scats on Bruny Island and about that them getting stuffed up by the Fox Task Force about actually um, verifying that and dealing with it. So I'd had the idea for a while that there were more foxes around, more widespread than, um, than people had really realised. There was sort of this idea that it was somehow confined to the Midlands and, and um, up around Longford area and maybe across in Burnie. Um, yeah, so it's been really worrying to think that that spread's gone on. And um, yeah, I just don't know what can be done now, especially because there's still a serious antagonism to actually doing the baiting and to participating in that program in some quarters. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it's only a 90% take up they get in the farms when you consider mm. the size of some properties. Mm. That's, yeah, there you mm. go. True. Um, the scat collection has been, well, the results have come up, um, they've been very uh, <laughs> unusual. The, all the experts can't make sense of them, the people in the program can't. They've never found two scats from the one fox. Um, they've found individual scats located in various places and they've never found any evidence of breeding of foxes. Mm. And um, I'm just trying to find <laughs> a question out of this, but it's something that um, a lot of scientists are trying to weigh up the evidence of these foxes and trying to make sense whether there could be an issue with the laboratory work, whether it could be the scat collection, it could be the um, the method, yeah, the DNA being um, yeah. Mixed mm. around. Have you heard anything about this issue with the individual scats? Because they, the fox will defecate six or eight times a day. So finding individual scats in various places around the state? Um, no, look, I haven't, I'm, I've, I haven't really um, heard any detailed critique around the scat collection and, and basically what it's, what it, how unusual um, the pattern is that's being exhibited. Um, but I've, I've, I've realised that there's sort of something that's not quite adding up. Um, and I don't know 
I don't know what it means, obviously, as, as other people don't. What I'm concerned about is we need to act as if the foxes are there until we know they're not. Mm. And not the other way around. Yeah. Well, that's a, <laughs> because, yeah, the because uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the precautionary principle. Mm. Because otherwise, if we let it go, we've lost it. Mm. Um, but if they're that far widespread. Yeah, then we're in serious difficulty. <laughs> we're, we, I mean, you know, how do we do it um, unless we do have a landscape wide um, approach? Mm. Um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's we're, yeah, we're in, we're in difficulty. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, pretty much, yeah, covered most of the stuff I wanted to cover. Um, yeah, could go over all the, you know, science and, uh, yeah. There, I mean, there was one article which I think I might have put a link on it, my first email to you. Did uh, you get a chance to, the Clive Marks one? He was a, he's a internationally renowned Fox expert who wrote about no, the physical I didn't, evidence. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I didn't look yeah. at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he, he's he's trying to weigh it all up and sort of can't make sense of what the task force is finding. Yeah. And, yeah. And it seems to. I mean, the public relation is a nightmare for the program. They're ridiculed everywhere they go. People I've spoken to, they're embarrassed to say they work for it. And, yes. Yeah. So yeah, it's, that's it's right. And I mean, you just see. I mean, it's become a cultural thing that you. You you know if you want to ridicule something you say it's sort of like you know a fox sighting in you know whatever, um, uh, which is really really unfortunate and it again it's this failure of education in a sense mm. about the fact that you're not going to see them until you know until it's far too late, mm. um, and that I mean you know when you think about the landscape and trying to find evidence, is you know. Tasmania looks small, but it's actually quite a big place yeah. to try and find a coherent body of evidence before you've actually been overwhelmed by the problem. And that's, that's you know, the unfortunate part of the situation. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, most of the money that's being spent on the program is all being used under one umbrella organisation in Canberra. Mm. Um, and it's been criticised because it hasn't been open to review um pretty much everyone that's reviewed the program has come from within that sort of umbrella group who make them make the baits they um train the dogs they um do the dna detections you think there's there should be more room for that and, um... well i think there probably does need to be some external review but it needs to be done by people with expertise not by people who've got an axe to grind against the program Mm. Um, it's very but, hard to find. Yeah, and that's that's the difficulty um, because it is hard to find that. Um, but you know, when you've got um, uh, a group like that, a, a body that's in a defensive position um, because, well, of a range of government stuff ups, their own stuff ups, and the difficulty of the pro of the problem that they're dealing with in the first place, and the way you, you're going to find and not find evidence. Um, then it's not wise in terms of PR and credibility to just have people who are internal to that somehow review it. There's got to be some external expertise that can be sort of neutral and even-handed that can be brought in to have a look, you would hope, um, to help um, sharpen things up. Because the thing is, although there's been a lot of uh, criticism around disbelief and ridicule, of the program for people who don't sort of seem to think that there are foxes. There's also been quite a lot of criticism from um, conservation interests who seriously believe that they, we probably have got a problem, but they want to feel, feel that it's being dealt with um, appropriately um, in a very focused way. And, they're not, and they've been unsure um, at times that that's what they're actually getting. At what, what point do you think they because this has always come up and um, where the program goes from an eradication program to a monitoring program mm, because mm. so far they haven't come up with a fox carcass that they've killed through the baiting mm. which I mean um, there are explanations for that but um, the sightings have become fewer and the, there's been so many breeding seasons since mm. the original suppose mm. importation that you'd think they'd be much more widespread and we'd be seeing them more. Mm. It's, 
it normally takes about eight years for a population to really take off and mm. it's been well beyond that. At what point do you think they can draw a line and say we, we'll start monitoring and starting to move from the baiting or eradication program? Oh my goodness, I mean I'm just not an expert um, to probably be able to say when you could move from baiting to monitoring. Um, I mean if if baiting has been successful enough that we're not seeing increased sightings, that's good. If in fact foxes haven't spread well enough or there's something else inhibiting them, good. Um, I'm just nervous that we don't move from a baiting to a monitoring program too soon mm. um, because then we risk the explosion of population that we've been wanting to avoid at the same time. Clearly the, it costs a lot in resources and you'd want to know that you're actually tackling a real problem um, given all the other issues you've got in nature conservation and with feral species that need dealing with. Um, but this is the most serious of them. Um, and it's got to be prioritised in that way for as long as we think that we actually still might have a problem. Mm. I think they've got about three or four more years mm. with, with the current funding, mm. but yeah. I mean, you yeah. hear people say, why don't you put the money into feral cats and this sort of thing? Different, different and I've done a lot of campaigning about dealing with feral yes. cats. Um, and I think the best thing that's going on now is, is you know, the compulsory desexing and um, and registration for cats, that's what was always needed to be the first step before you went out into the wild to try and knock over the rest of the feral population, otherwise you'd have ongoing recruitment. So in a sense, the first steps for that are in hand. Um, and it is, a, and yes, they're a problem, but nothing along the lines of what a runaway feral uh, fox population would be. And, and clearly, many people don't understand that. True, mm. yes. All right. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much covered. Is there anything else that you... No, I don't think so. I mean, no, the, main, the main thing for me was that it was just a terribly frustrating experience at the time when um, resources need to be, needed to be pumped in urgently and, the, and the, uh, the potential that foxes were there hit really hard, that instead there was just all the shilly-shallying and confusion on behalf of government, this inability to get their act together to get resources and in fact um, a, a downright reluctance um, from the minister and and the head of his department to do anything about getting resources um, and and meanwhile you know it sort of looked like it was all slipping away uh, and and um, you know when they're when they're meant to be you know have the expertise and have the ability to um, to act and and you can't even get them to focus um, that's awful and when it gets to a situation where um, ridiculing foxes is you know um, is a very socially acceptable and, and marvelous sport um, that's that's a real concern that government could have ever um, allowed it to get to that situation without taking it in hand and mm. it is the fault of, of, of government for not having got onto it with their um, public relations and their explanations as much as it's the fault of the people who who decided to get into ridicule. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean that low density population, people don't understand just no. how massive <laughs> that is and how difficult. No. I'm deeply concerned it's all too late and we've either got yeah. foxes everywhere or I don't know. But, um, I don't know, I, I mean, I, I, I was... What, I, what yeah. I'm reading and what I'm learning of where they're at at the moment, none of it makes sense. Whether we have a huge population, we have a low density one, whether the whole thing's whether they're killing everything, they haven't got any data. No. They've got nothing. No. Um, no, it's it's quite extraordinary um, that you've got a Fox, Fox Task Force operating for so long and they don't have any data, but then you know you had the problems that they knew better than the experts who actually came to tell them what to do in the first instance. So you really don't know whether it's because they're stuffing it up or because there isn't any data, you know? <laughs> um or a bit of both. I mean, who knows? Um, I know after I went to this um, uh, meeting in in Signet in the town hall, when they played me, when they played the sound of the fox, I thought I'd heard that, and I hadn't known what it was. I just heard it and thought that's a bit odd, and it hadn't occurred to me that it might be a fox, mm -hmm. and I'd heard it the previous winter. 
There's a guy up north called Jim Stevenson who's put a lot of his own money into trying to educate the public about the fox calls and he says that the program won't have anything to do with him so he's done his own private fox control association thing mm. and he's highly critical he says there's no way you can bait to kill foxes the way they do and the only way to do it is to track them to hear them because he's from England where he's he was brought up around them mm. Mm. yeah mm. but um, yeah yeah. Just well, I mean, I have to say, I was a bit surprised that, that was that you know that community meeting was the first time that anybody introduced me to what a fox might sound like because you know when you think about it, you're probably more likely to hear them than to see them mm. um, if you're living, you know, in the bush or in or like where I do there in a mosaic of farmland and bushland. Um, you know, you you may you may see one, but you're more likely to hear it if it's around. One of the strangest things is. The foxes, I mean, they're, they're always stationary for four months of the year when they're breeding. Mm. And during that time, they create, I mean, around the den, they create a huge mess of scats and so there's dry food and that. They're always stationary around, and that's been going on for 10 years, yet they haven't found a den mm. anywhere. Mm. I mean, that, I know that what, the size of Tasmania, the, I mean, the odds are against them, but mm. it's quite extraordinary. It and is. For that many breeding yeah. seasons. Yeah, that's right. It is an extraordinary thing. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, foxes are cunning and they hide away well. Do they hide away that well? Mm -hmm. I don't well, know. I've never found a scat near the baiting stations either where they've been baiting. So. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they, they, they've just got this dearth of evidence or data at least. Yes. But, I mean, they're picking up bits and pieces, but they're not, yeah. none of it. That's sense. right. I mean, is there so much food around that the foxes don't need to go near a baiting station? Yes. Yeah, there's That's an true. awful yeah. lot of possums. There is, there's plenty there. <laughs> Any number of them get run over. I mean, you mm -hmm. just see it all the time. So I don't know whether they need to go to your baiting station. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a very difficult. It's really hard. Problem. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I hope, I hope it's that there aren't any. Mm. But I don't know that I wouldn't, I wouldn't I mean, like to leap, take the leap it? of faith and say that was the case. That's it. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank okay. you very much for your time.